he's talking about who should we thank. Well, I think we ought to thank God, don't you? And uh, so two places I want to read with you this morning. First of all, let's go to uh, Psalms 100. Psalms 100. Let's start there. And uh, it's a not very long psalm. And so we can read all the way through it here. It's only what, five verses. Five verses. And it says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Did we try to make a joyful noise this morning? Think you ought to come to church and make a joyful noise? Well, so, uh, I'm not very good at singing, but uh, I had to memorize a tune for a song to even be able to sing it. But uh, we try to make a joyful noise. And, I want to come and lift the Lord up and be thankful for all that God's done for us. Verse 2, serve the Lord with a, uh, gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God, is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are the, his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord God is good and his mercy <clears throat> mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations now there's quite a bit in that little psalm if you kind of break the thing down don't you think we ought to come to church and of course this is talking about Israel going and worshiping God and uh, they make a joyful noise and I think we'd be happy to come and get together with the other Christians and fellowship. It amazes me. I talk to people and they say that they tell me they're a Christian. I say, well, "Where do you go to church?" And they don't go to church. I think Christians ought to go to church, don't you? Yeah. Ought to find them a place with some people that believe the same way they do, and we need to encourage each other. You need any encouragement? You know, you get to looking at the world the way it is. And of course, I my hope is in Jesus. It's the only hope I have. Sure not the Democrats or Republicans. I don't think they're going to save us, do you? But I'm looking for Jesus to come back. And I think the Lord's still working. He's in control. Some people think they're in control. I think God's in control. Amen. We don't understand it all. It says, enter in the, the, His gates and I think we did you enter the gate when you come in this morning? Carol had, Carol said we ought to paint the front door red. I remember down in uh, when they were down in Egypt they put blood across the top of the door, the sides of the door. And then the Passover lamb passed over where the blood had been applied. If you're here this morning you're saved, has the blood been applied? Amen. Manny brought that out in his Sunday school lesson. Uh, of course he He's talking about being washed, you know, he used Titus. And he's talking about us being washed. And I said, well, you're washed by the word. Man, he said, well, I got something better. You're washed by the blood. But when Peter was getting his feet washed by Jesus, and uh, Peter said, no, Lord, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus said, uh, uh, if you're not, if I, you don't let me wash your feet, you're not mine. And Peter said, well, then just wash me all over. He wanted to be fully God's, right? Wouldn't it be good to be God in control? Amen. But the Lord said, no. He said, you don't need to get washed all over. That'd be washed with the blood. Did the Lord wash your sins away with His blood when He died on the cross? Amen. But you might need to get your feet washed. You ever need your feet washed? Well, I think the Word washes your feet. That's right. Somebody says, well, I don't know. I come to church and the preacher preaches and all that just goes through like going through a strainer. I think, I hope some of it sticks in there. But even if it doesn't, if it goes through a strainer, at least the strainer is cleaner That's right. after the water goes so through. Isn't that what the Lord needs to do? And so we come and we study God's Word and we come through the gates and we sing and we praise God this morning. And I uh, want to be thankful that we have a God to worship and some God that loved us and cared about us and 
sent his son to die on the cross. Then he says, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. I, I'm afraid in America we might have lost a few generations. So I says, Why? Well, I think that they get their brains washed in the in the schools. Right. And this COVID thing brought a lot of that out, didn't it? Parents got to see what they're teaching kids in the schools. And then now look what's going on in the college campuses. Not good. Some people, it amazes me, educated people think it's all right to be terrorists. Well, you know what they say? Well, I mean, after all, they're college, they're educated, right? But I don't know if they've got any common sense. Of course, they just pair it back. You know, really, college is supposed to make you learn to think. But I don't think that's what they're doing now. I think they want you to think what they tell you to think. Don't you think you ought to think for yourself? Maybe you ought to get you a Bible and go to reading it and see if it tells you anything. Amen. I think it'll tell you a lot of things. Tell you how to get saved. Won't it? It'll even tell you how you ought to live your life. Then one other place I wanted to go, we read through that song. Now I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and, and there's about three verses or so I want to read here. Ephesians chapter 5, let's go down around verse 20. And uh, he says, I want to read uh, verse 19, 20, and 21. Verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Is that kind of, does that kind of tie in with that psalm we read back there in the Old Testament? Should you go worship God and sing and praise? And I think maybe you ought to enjoy being here this morning. Well, what, what do you enjoy about it? Well, I enjoy being around the other Christians. You know, I'm looking forward one of these days. My mom and dad have already passed on, my brother. I really don't have any family other than Karen, Martin, and Brian, uh, Carol, Martin, and Brian, and left down here. Well, you've got some brother, a brother and some sister, but on my side, I'm it. But I'm going to see them again. Amen. Isn't that my hope? I'm looking forward to getting together with them. And plus, there's been people I've gone to church with over the years, and I'm going to see them again. And uh, you know, would that be something good to come to church and think about and praise the Lord for and thank the Lord for that we have this hope that we're going to see our loved ones again. That's the best hope I know to give you. Most people out here, the people aren't saved, they don't have any hope. They think you do, but I, they do, but I think it's a false hope, don't you? They think science, politics, education, that's going to save them. No, the only thing that's going to save them. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And if you don't go through Jesus, you're not going to get to heaven. He's the only way. But here in these verses, we just started reading verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual psalms, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Should we come here? Should you pray for each other? Should you care about each other? We shouldn't be thinking we're better than anybody else. Lord loves all of us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I, I like 1 John 2 too. He is a propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but for, for the sins of the whole world. He even died for all the lost people. That's right. Whether they accept it or not, He made a way. It's up to them what they do with it. Somebody says, uh, you know, God sends people to hell. God doesn't send any people to hell. They decide to, if they want to go to heaven or hell, don't That's they? That's right. It's in their hands. It's what they do with about Jesus. It's not whether you're a Baptist. I'm kind of partial toward Baptist. After all, as a Baptist baptized Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And if a Methodist baptized you, what would you be? 
you'd be a Methodist, right? Well, Jesus baptized you. Because I don't think the Baptist denomination, I don't think I can trace it back. I think we can trace the doctrine. Amen. But you know, we have so much in th to be thankful for. Uh, I think it would uh, be hard to count it all. It'd be, I guess, like coming up to the altar. If you come to the altar and get saved, do you have to list and say, Lord, forgive me and name every sin you ever did? Huh? Well, you couldn't even remember them, could you? But God remembers them all, and then He forgives you for them, and then He puts them behind His back and buries them in the deepest sea and removes them as far as the east is from the west, and He'll never remember them again. God works a miracle on Himself not to remember your sin if you ask Him to forgive you and save you. Now, I don't know about you. Is that something to be thankful for? Yes, sir. Well, usually that's not the kind of thing we think of. You know what we usually think of? I'm thankful for, a, a, I got a new Cadillac, a house, material things. Right. Or, uh, you know, uh, pleasure, enjoyment, leisure things. But uh, we ought to be more thankful for the spiritual things, the things that God's done for us. That we can have a home in heaven. I've been saved for a long time. I guess I said I was probably 11 or 12 years old. I'm 77 now. I haven't lost it, but I didn't keep it either. And I didn't get it for myself in the first place. God did it for me. Isn't that something to be thankful for? And uh, so we think about these fellas. Uh, you know, we think, well, we can look and, uh, oh, I guess I wouldn't mind having a house up at the harbors, you know, on the lake, the big boat out back. Well, I lived down on South Nine, but I'm thankful I got a place to sleep at night. Aren't you? Thankful that I have what I have. Want to be content with what we have. You know, if we get to looking around, some people have more than we do, some people have less. Well, we shouldn't covet the ones that have more. Maybe if we get to looking, there's a lot of people who have a whole lot less. One fellow said, you know, he said, uh, an old proverb said, I uh, had no socks and complained until I saw a man with no feet. And we'll just look around. Have you got more than other people? Well, if you do, God gave it to you. But what they have, God gave them too. And so we look at these things and think about it. And when we think, like I said, we think about houses and cars and clothes and material things. Matthew 16, 26 says, Jesus said, For what is a man probably should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall man give in exchange for his soul? Is that more important than having a big fancy house? Oh, yeah. Now, Martin thinks I want a Cadillac. How many here think I want a Cadillac? <laughs> well, if I wanted a fancy car, I'd probably get a Mercedes Benz or, you know. But in my day, the Cadillac was kind of a status symbol, you know. So that's why I say Cadillac. And sometimes Nancy, when she's here, she says, well, you date yourself. Well, you know, I, t I talk some things, Manny over here, he and Casey and Lily, they'd probably look at me and say, what's he talking about? I never heard of that before. Because it was before their time. But uh, that, that, that's what I mean when I talk about wanting a Cadillac. It's a, a symbol of big success, you know. I remember we were out going door to door, and, and Martin back there was with me, and he, we're out in front of this big fancy house, and Martin's looking at the house, and he, he says, uh, well, they don't need all that. Bible talks about Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but son of man didn't have a place to lay his head. You think he's got a good place to lay his head now? Well, that's an anthropomorphism. But God does talks about us have, him having feet and hands and head so we can understand him better. Amen. If God didn't reveal himself to me, I couldn't even know. And I'm thankful Jesus came down. I can relate to Jesus better than I can relate to God the Father. Yeah. 
because he took on a body like I am. It says he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin, sin in Hebrews. Chapter 4, he talks about that down near the end of the chapter. You know, I was reading just the last this last week's study. You know, Paul was shipwrecked. He went hungry. Spent a night in the deep in the uh, water and uh, was beaten with cat and nine tails several times with rods. He was stoned. And then he said, call that light affliction. <laughs> and we think we got it bad because somebody gets mad at us if we try to witness to them or something. Huh? But Paul said that was light affliction. But what was Paul comparing that to? He's comparing it to what Jesus suffered. Amen. And whatever we suffer in this life is nothing compared to what Jesus suffered to be able to save you and make a way for you to go to heaven. Now if you look at it that way, whatever we would go through in this life, but one big advantage we Christians have is we've got somebody going through it with us. Amen. You have the Holy Spirit. Really, can you talk to God anytime, anytime? You don't have to make an appointment. Huh? You just start talking to Him. Well, I do it. Now, I don't bow my head if I'm driving the car, but I still can talk to God. Can I talk to God with my eyes open? Or with my eyes closed? I can lay in bed and talk to Him. Or I can get down on my knees. I've seen some people lay flat on the floor face down to pray and talk to God. But I think it doesn't matter if your heart's right. You can talk to Him in any of those ways. You know, if, you, if for anything, we ought to be thankful for the, this morning for what Jesus came and died on the cross for us and made a way for us to go to heaven. He provides everyone uh, that will call on Him in faith. Now, it bothers me sometimes these preachers get on TV and all this. Area. Now, just say this little prayer. And if you just say this little prayer, you'll be saved. Well, you can say all the words you want, but if your heart's not in it, it's not going to do you any good. They're just some words you said. You have to believe what you're praying for. You have to believe God will save you. But a lot of people, I think, make false professions, and it's dangerous. Isn't it? Wouldn't it be better to really know the Lord spoke to your heart? Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I like that. But I like Romans 10, 9, 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's not just saying some words. You've got to believe something. Or the words don't really mean anything, do they? But I like Romans 8. He says, His Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Has His Spirit borne witness with your spirit that you're saved? Do you really know God? So well, I read the Bible through. Well, when I was in Bible college, you know, some of the guys studying to be preachers got saved their first year in Bible college. And some of them, they'd say, well, they read, said, well, I've read the Bible. But you have to believe it in your heart. Just, and I like John 14, 1 through 3. says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Are you going to go be where Jesus is at? That's what I believe. I believe I'm going to go be with Jesus and uh, my loved ones that have trusted Jesus like I have. Heaven's the home of the saved, isn't it? It's going to be my home. Right now I live down here, but I'm going to be living with the Lord. You know, heaven's a real place. I heard a cultist say, well now, you know, the fundamentalists say, well, you go up to heaven. He said, well, if you're in America and you went up 
you go one direction. If you were in China, you went up, you'd go in another direction. Yeah. And so he's trying to say what we believe is not, doesn't make any sense. Any place in the world up is north. Are you going to go down to Chicago or up to Chicago? North. Well, north, I'm going up. I go down south. Of course, right. the southerners not, might not like, like that, you know. They think you're picking on them. Huh? Because to them, that's home. My home is going to be, I'm going up where Jesus is at. And Carol doesn't tell the little kids in Sunday school, well, you're going to die and go to hell. Because they'll go home and tell my mom and their mom and dad to start mentioning hell and they won't lie. She says, you're going to go down where the devil's at. Huh? Yeah, I, I believe that uh, we're going to go, some people that aren't saved, they're going to go be where the devil's at. I don't want to go where the devil's at. You know, Nicodemus is talking to Jesus and uh, he said that uh, Jesus tells him that he came down from heaven and he's going to go back to heaven. Well, he came down and he went up. Then if you go to Acts chapter 1, he says, there's two men standing there in white apparel in Acts chapter 1. says, uh, looking, watching Jesus go up and, and uh, people are standing there watching and looking. And they say, uh, what do you say? He's going to come back in like manner as he went up. He's got to go back the same way he went up. Of course, some of the cults set dates he didn't show up when they thought. Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh Day Adventists, they set dates. And the Bible says we shouldn't be trying to set dates, we'll just be looking for him to come anytime. I wouldn't mind if he come right now. Really, I wouldn't. Especially as I've gotten older and more aches and pains. But, but you know, I was out and visiting, I've talked to people going door to door, and the fellow says, well, uh, uh, well, nobody's ever gone up to heaven, and uh, nobody's seen heaven. How do you know there's a heaven? Is it a real place or not? Oh, Has anybody seen it? Didn't Jesus come down from heaven and he went back to heaven? And if you, uh, another fellow, if you look at the book of Revelation, the last chapter or so there, he describes heaven to you, really. The New Jerusalem. He describes it in detail. The foundations, the gates, pearly gates, golden streets. Somebody says, well, I don't know if I can believe that. I think it would be that or better. Huh? Of course, I guess it's like a Cadillac thing. <laughs> How good could heaven be? Well, I don't think we can even imagine what it would be completely. Not, not seen or heard. It'd be better than anything we could ever imagine. But if you look at, you go to Saint Corinthians chapter twelve with me. And Paul, he says he got to see heaven. John says he got to see heaven and he described it in the last part of the book of Revelation. And then if we go over here to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about seeing heaven. So have some people seen it or not? Yes, sir. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, let's look there. And uh, start in verse 1. And Paul's talking, I believe, here about himself, but he talks like he's talking about somebody else. And uh, verse uh, 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, It's not expedient for uh, me to doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Well, these Corinthians saying he wasn't really an apostle. They didn't want to listen to him. Uh, really, he spends two books trying to help them get their church straightened out. That's right. Some think he might have even wrote a third one that we don't have. But at least we have two, don't we? Did the Corinthian church have any problems? Did Paul try to help them get some of that stuff straightened out? And then some of them are saying, well, we're not going to listen to Paul. Well, Paul said, I'm an apostle. They said it was an apostle born out of due season. Of course, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. Verse 2, I knew a man named Christ about 14 years ago. I think he knew himself. 
But he says, I knew a man. I don't think he wants to brag here. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such an one caught up to the third heaven. Now, I believe third heaven is where God's at. There's a first heaven, second heaven. I think you're breathing the first heaven. That's right. Then the second heaven is where all the planets are at. I think God's even higher than that. The third heaven. Oh, yeah. And so he, Paul's talking about, it. he doesn't know if it was a vision or it really went in the body. Isn't that kind of what he says here? When you read those verses, he said, I knew a man Christ about 14 years ago. So this is an experience that he had. You know, some people tell you their experience and they base their faith on that. I base my faith on the Bible, but I, this is in the Bible. God inspired this. So I believe this is a true experience. Somebody said, oh, explain my experience. I can't explain your experience, but my experience. But if it's in the Bible, I believe it. And now the way we ought to look at it, and he says, he knew this man about 14 years ago, whether in the body, uh, I cannot tell. Whether uh, out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not uh, lawful for a man to utter <laughs> And such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but of mine infirmities. Of course, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He prayed three times for God to forgive him uh, and heal that thorn in the flesh. And God said, my grace is sufficient. I'm not going to heal it. but And Paul, if you go and read and study it, he was afraid he'd get too impressed with himself. But you think Paul accomplished anything? He wrote the biggest part of the New Testament. Did he start quite a few churches? Oh yeah, including this one. Uh -huh. He started all kinds of these. So but right pride cometh before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Oh. Oh. But, you know, these people kept harassing him so bad, not wanting to believe him, so finally he says, that's foolish, but I, we shouldn't really compare ourselves with ourselves, for, with each other. God, you know, you ought to have a personal relationship with God. And everybody's personal relationship's different. Don't you believe that'd be the case? Yes, sir. Do you know your son? Can you know it? Can you know what God wants you to do? But I don't know what God wants you to do. My, it's not my job to know what God wants you to do. He wants you to get saved, I know that. But as far as the details of your life, I think that'll come down and get you a Bible and go to reading it and God will show you. That's right. Won't he? And I don't know, I think he dropped some of you in here at Bible Baptist Church I don't know where you came from. I never visited. <laughs> Manny says, I didn't even know where Indiana was before he came. Right. And Lord's brought people. We got people from all over the place here. Somebody says, well, there's not that many people here. We got one from Nicaragua. We have one from Colombia. Puerto Rico background. Mexico. We have had one from China. They don't come here anymore, but they were from China. Lord's got ways of bringing people together, hasn't he? Yeah. What about couples? He brings man and wife together? Yeah. Isn't that something? Is that something to be thankful for? Yeah. Uh huh? Well, I'm thankful for my wife. She's put up with me for 50 some years. I don't know how she's done it. Now she got on me last night. She said, you didn't kiss me good night. I guess I shouldn't confess that. Now she's going to crawl under the pew over there and say, you don't mention me. Maybe she's like Paul. 
Huh? Maybe we ought to be kind of somewhat like Paul. But God loves us the way we are. He made us the way we are. And take whatever God gave you, be thankful for it, and try to do something with it for God. If I didn't preach any more this morning, would that be enough? That'd be enough of a sermon right there, wouldn't it? If we didn't get any past that. But no, I believe heaven's a real place. You believe heaven's a real place? You believe you're going there? Then another thing, it's a glorious lighted city. Amen. Revelation chapter 21, verse 23 says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did light it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Amen. I don't even think we'll have an electric bill. <laughs> Anybody got electric bills? We got all kinds of bills. And there will be a there won't be any cloudy days in heaven. Sir. Land of the unclouded day. We sing that in a song. Not only is it a real place, it's a, a glorious, bright city and that God lights up. And of course, we could go to Revelation and study a lot more about it, but it's a place of perfection. You know, I, sometimes I have trouble with that. I know I'm not perfect. Really, I look forward to going to heaven. Then I won't have to think about any sin because I won't sin. But down here I do sometimes. What should we do? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So all the citizens of heaven will be perfect. I don't believe there will be any crime or violence or sin there. Amen. Is there any down here? Would you like to go to a place where they don't have all that? Well, Karen came from Portland. They were shooting and... Mm -hmm. All kinds of stuff. She said, but Indianapolis, when I was growing up, if they had one murder a year, that was about it. Now there's several a day. Are we getting worse or better as far as in this world? Don't you want to go to some place where it's better? I do. I think there's something inside people that want something better. Wonder who put that there. Think maybe God did? He wants something better. Revelation chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. And one of the elders answered and said unto me, uh, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and uh, whence came they? Well, these are people that died in the tribulation period. If you go and study the passage in Romans, Revelation chapter 7. And then they're asking, Lord, how long till you come back and set up your kingdom? And so John's looking at this. I think it's an angel talking to him. One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. So John's saying, well, the angel asked John that. And John says, well, you know. I think the angels know more than we know. But they don't know how to be saved because they don't get saved. They're created all host at once. Right. And they watch us. They're interested in how we act toward God. They watch you after you get saved. They look into stuff like that. But then I believe they're sent to help us. You think angels help you? Now I'm going to throw this in here for free. I hear these people on TV talking about when we die we become angels. That doesn't happen. We're not going to ever be angels. We're going to be saved people in heaven. And he said, and I said unto him, Sir, uh, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation. Does that narrow it down? I think that'd be the last three and a half years of the tribulation, the worst part of it. Probably got, they were martyred, but they were saved. Will they go to heaven? But wouldn't it be better to get saved now? Amen. 
then I believe you can bypass that part. Of course, there's different people who believe different ways. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to try to go into all that this morning. But these are they that came out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the right. Lamb. Are they saved people? Was the blood applied? It says so. The poem says, I saw myself one day uh, one day facing God's great scale of judgment. You know, a lot of people think we're going to get up to heaven and our good and bad is going to be put on the scale. And if our good outweighs our bad, we'll make it into heaven. You know, a lot of people believe that way. There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof the ways of the death. If you're trying to work your way to heaven, you'll never get to heaven that way. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But you have to receive the gift. Jesus is a pretty great gift. Well, the greatest gift you'll get at Christmas would be to be saved. Wouldn't it? And so uh, this poem says, I saw myself one day facing God's great scale of judgment. I offered up my baptism and the scale uh, cried out, not enough. Some people think if they get baptized, they're going to heaven. The Bible doesn't teach that. I think there'd be some wet pit lost people. They went in center and they came out of center. And they didn't really, but if they, the, you got to get saved before you get baptized. That's a testimony. I offered unto my, I offered my church membership, confirmation, money, and good works, but the scale cried again, not enough. Aren't a lot of people trying to do it this way, that way, and some other way? There's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way. Only one way. That's right. Acts 4.12 says, there's one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I wonder what that name is. I believe it's Jesus. And He the one that died on the cross? And that His blood washes away your sins? Finally, in desperation, so all those things weren't enough, finally in desperation I made the ultimate sacrifice. I climbed on the scale and gave myself, but the scale cried out, uh, not enough. In my worst moment of deepest despair, my Savior came and met me with, uh, met me there. Off came my works, my badge, my pride, and only my Savior to stand by my side. Does Jesus come and get us in? It won't be Peter standing at the pearly gates letting you in. It'd be Jesus. He's going to be the judge. Isn't he going to be the judge or not? He, lo uh, he lovingly folded his arms about me and said, For this cause I have risen for thee. The scale tipped but once and swayed side to side, and the saints of all the ages cried, Justified! If we're in Christ, we're justified. How do you get in Christ? You get saved. You trust Him as your Savior. And that's how you get saved. And that's how we're justified. The saints in heaven will be seen. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing but, Nothing but the blood. I like the song, There is a fountain filled with blood from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lays all their guilty stand. Let's all stand. Here this morning.